Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Lights on Data show. Today, we're going to talk about why data teams must adopt empathy. Wonderful. Our great guest today is Jeremy Adamson. Jeremy is a technology strategy consultant, as well as the author of Mining the Machines, and as well the recently published book, Geeks with Empathy. Congratulations on the book. I have it here, everyone. This is it. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you very much for being on our show. Well, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm a huge fan. George's other shows on data governance have actually <laughs> saved me in past engagement. So real honor to be here. <laughs> Great I appreciate to have that. you. Yeah. Um, as always, we would like to start by asking you if you can share a fun fact or a hobby about yourself. Sure. Uh, recent hobby I've gotten back into just because the kids are on March break is uh, board games. So we've been... Ooh. We got a giant uh, cabinet full of board games here. We've been tacking into to keep them occupied. So do we, as you That's can awesome. see. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. yeah, half of it is books, half of it is board games. So. Yeah, George is a big fan. We have forty of them, and oh, wow. he always yeah. feels that we're not playing enough. <laughs> so that's great. Enjoy. Yeah. yeah. All right, Jeremy. Let's get into our topic. Can you share with us why you believe empathy is crucial for data teams, especially in today's technology landscape? Yeah, happy to. And I, I think an important place to start is with the second part of your question. And, and you really need to uh, set the context for today's technology landscape. I think back 10 years earlier on in my career, teams were quite a bit smaller. People were much more generalized. And I, I recall one in particular, there was a guy who was an amazing DBA and, and had a great eye for visualization. So a weird combination Another person on the team was a mechanical engineer in a past life, great project manager, and he was also an amateur developer, a data scientist. Really together, they, they filled all the gaps and, and you had the whole analytics value chain covered in two people. But if you look at today, there's going to be a lot more people at the table. You're going to have a government specialist, scrum masters and architects and engineers and scientists and so on and so forth. And, and each one is only going to be dealing with a narrow piece of the problem. So rather than, I think what tradition is kind of an artisanal creative cycle, now it's much more of this mechanistic assembly line where no one person really sees the whole project from end to end. So, you know, with, with that as, as the, the backdrop and the context, I think the reason why empathy is so important in that case is if, if you look at a data engineer, this coming Monday, a new sprint is going to begin and their scrum master is going to tell them that for the next two weeks, you need to develop this artifact that includes A, B, and C. So if I'm that data engineer, then what's my role and, and what does success look like and, and who am I helping? Essentially, I'm doing what my scrum master tells me. I throw that deliverable over the fence and I, I, I wait for more instructions to arrive. And it, it detaches you from your peers. It detaches you from the mm -hmm. company. And at the end of the day, what do you tell your kids you did? It's not, uh, it, it doesn't inspire, I would mm -hmm. say. But if I, if you zoom out, if you look at that same engineer doing the same work, if it's explained in a different way, if that person knows that Julie, the CFO, asked the VP for a weekly update, and that is going to be used for some investor relations call, now you're not helping some technical abstraction. You're not just creating a data artifact. You're helping Julie, the CFO, and when that earnings call happens, you can tell the kids, hey, that, uh, that was me. I, I inspired that. So it's so kind of a long answer, but that's why I think it's important is because our, our roles are getting more and more specialized, more fragmented. We're getting more isolated, and we need to reorient ourselves uh, to our, our people and our peers rather than just the technology so that we feel more connected to the people we're working with. You mentioned in the book, especially as um, technology professionals, that Yes, when we're starting in schools, there might be some group dynamic there that you're collaborating on different projects and so on. In the end, you learn to take instructions, do your own thing, right? Do your homework, do your assignment, have your presentation. You're kind of solo there. Then you go into your first few jobs. It's kind of like you head down, you're doing your work, and you don't have that same uh, level of interaction that you would then need to have when maybe you, you step up into higher roles. And exactly. at that point, when you do, you're st struck with the reality that, uh, yeah, you need to practice that empathy as well to understand the other side and the other way around for the other, uh, other side to understand you and what you want to pass along. 
Exactly. We have a lot to offer. We just need to speak the same language, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, well said. Well yeah. said. So you start your book in a with a very uh, good story, I think. It's uh, really drawing you in. And the first sentence here, he said you were a turnip. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, that's my little preview here for you to read the book, but it's a conversation that you're relating between yourself and your mentor at the time. And uh, w one thing I, I wanted to ask you, it, it, he or she gives some really good uh, recommendations there on what you can do in order to be able to present something better to uh, those executive stakeholders and, and sponsors of the project. But, and throw the book as well, you're having a lot of anecdotes and a lot of good stories that reinforces that message of why that's important um, to have good communication. You're also addressing change management at one point, which is, I know Diana is very happy uh, to hear that every time. But I think the other way around should also be true, right? The, the business side should also practice empathy. Absolutely. Yeah. And I... I, I can see where they're coming from. I think they see analytics and data folks just as an extension of IT, where they're used to submitting a ticket, give me a new keyboard, reset my password. It's a command and they get a response and, and they don't instinctively see us as partners in scoping out projects. So it's, it's a long held inherited relationship that we, we both need to work towards redefining, but I think it's uh Everybody's come to that point organically. There's no malice behind mm -hmm. it. It's just what they're used to. But I think everybody's open to renegotiating that if we can articulate the value of it. Definitely. Yeah. Pedro Cardoso, who's a fellow Canadian here and amazing mind in the data space as well, says, no one remembers what you do, but they never forget how you make them feel. So empathy and listening to understand are leading competencies that I stress to our data ninja consultants. Mm -hmm. And then Everett is mentioning that all relationships are two-way streets, takes empathy and active listening on both sides to develop trust. And by the way, I think Dan is another advocate and yeah, leading uh, voice in this field as well. Nice. I love that quote. I think it's Maya Angelou, isn't it? It might be. Perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've used it a few times too. It's a good one. It's something we forget quite often in technology. We see our role is to hand mm. something over and we forget that there's a person on the other side of that. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true, Jeremy. So can you provide some other examples or anecdotes that kind of illustrate the impact of empathy on data team dynamics or pro project outcomes? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. And like you mentioned, the, the book is actually is, is built around three personal stories. And I, I think that they're quite illustrative of what everybody goes through in their career. And, and the one that, that you had mentioned, the, uh, the turnip story, I've, I've got a few, uh, few <laughs> comments about that one over LinkedIn. And, and it was essentially the first time that I had ever presented in front of executive leadership. And I uh, probably tamped it down in the book a little bit, but it was an absolute disaster. I was uh, went into it quite arrogant. I, I was a single guy. I was working for the government, putting in long hours and uh, doing a master's on the side. So I, I thought I knew it all, and I was working on this great, meaningful project. It was technically challenging, uh, a little bit of data science, a little bit of finance, some civil engineering. And my mentor that I, I, I talk about a little bit in the book, absolutely amazing guy. He gave me full credit. He put me in front of this thing, and emotionally, I probably wasn't ready for that. Yeah. And he gave me an opportunity to present to the most senior person in the group, and the intention with that is to get funding and the opportunity to actually implement it, go to production with it. So smart guy that I was, I put together this 50 page deck showing how the generalized linear model works and the original SQL database and all the transformations I was going to do. And I was going to show this guy from base principles, what I did. The guy of course was a, a senior leader. He probably graduated in about 1970 and he was Brilliant guy, but, but completely non-technical. And I, I didn't empathize at all. I, I knew his name, but I didn't consider him beyond that, what he was, what his background was, what was important to him. So I rehearsed like crazy and I got in front of him and I gave this one hour lecture while he smiled and nodded. And uh, I go back to my desk thinking, yeah, I nailed this. And I got a, an email from my leader and he says, hey, buddy, do you want to talk about what just happened there? And I strut over to his office. I thought I was going to get promoted. 
And that's when he said, this guy called you a turnip. He was mad at me for wasting his time. He said that uh, you were arrogant. You completely messed this up. And my first instinct, of course, I was mad. I figured my boss is an idiot and this guy's an idiot and everybody except for me is wrong. So I, I started defending myself on technical grounds and, and he shut me down right away. He said, your only job going in there was to sell this to him. You needed him to approve it. You didn't need to prove anything to him. And, and that never occurred to me at all. I thought I need to go through the technical stuff. I need to convince him why this works and all that. And uh, he worked with me. He explained the guy's rationale that he's, he's senior. He's very risk averse, but he wants to be seen as innovative. He's got uh, cost restrictions. And he just told me about the guy, completely got the deck, five slides, zero math, just talking about the business outcomes and risk management. And it got approved in about 15 minutes. And, and that wouldn't have happened without that mentor giving me honest feedback and really uh, calling me a turnip, I, I think was one of the highlights of my career. <laughs> completely flipped my perspective. It was uh, so important. And that was the outcome. I put dozens of hours of work into that, 50 slides no empathy, complete failure, understanding the guy, 10 minute conversation, five slides in a conversation and, and had real success. I think empathy can have the same impact with most projects. Beautiful. Then ever mentions, welcome to sales. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> Absolutely. So throw the book. I also enjoy the fact that you're describing the different types of generations. <laughs> and uh, the different caveats that you need to be aware of. So I think that's very useful for anybody to, to learn. So yeah, I do recommend check out this book, Geeks with Empathy. It's full of uh, not just anecdotes that I think a lot of them would be relatable for a lot of people in the data space and the tech space, but also with advice and tips and guidance. And you have five tips actually on how to maybe be a bit more empathetic, practice empathy. And I, I wanna talk a little bit about the fifth one. And you're mentioning, I really like this, it says, exercise your heart. Mm. What uh, what did you want to mean by that? Cardio exercises, of course. Uh, before you answer that question, I just want yeah. to, just to close the, the topic that we um, talked about previously. So we have a, a comment here from Hubert. He says, sales, it's really not natural to all of us techies. And I think that's a great point um, because m one of my other takeaways from your story is that if you are a, um, a leader and if you have someone in your team that is very good technically and you want to enhance their skills, maybe have this type of conversation before the actual meeting. So you cannot assume that someone has these this empathy or uh, the, uh, the way that you call it, Jeremy, and it might not come naturally. Mm -hmm. And yes, absolutely, it will would enhance the message and will increase the chances of success in any situation. Situation. So let us also build our teams towards that and not assume that is um, already there and suggest books like <laughs> uh, Geeks with Empathy, of course. Mm. And now uh, let us go back, sorry for uh, for this parenthesis, so please go back to, to the, the fifth tip that George asked about. Yeah, of course. I, I, I think what I was going for with that one is Technical people quite often, when they have personal development opportunities and hours, they're doing coursework, they're, they're pursuing hobbies, it tends to be around technology. If you want continued education, you go get another certification. If you're going to volunteer somewhere, it's going to be for your local Python users group, that type of thing. So it's always gravitating around the same thing and you find yourself around the same type of people. And it's really hard to develop uh, a, a sense of what people outside of that subculture feel and, and what they see. So I would just encourage people to think a little more broadly. Instead, you got some reading time rather than reading, definitely read Geeks with Empathy, but also pick up some fiction, some stuff you wouldn't normally look at. Mm -hmm. Try to exercise your heart a little bit and read some uh, romance if, if, if that's outside of your comfort zone, rather than volunteering at a user group, volunteer with Rotary. Look for things that are uh, going to develop that sense of empathy and community in you rather than things that are going to develop your technical skills. Mm -hmm. You can't just treat this like another skill that you would develop. It's a very deep personal characteristic and it, it needs to be treated that way. I think. Well said. Yeah. And that's really so a, a nice uh, advice for data leaders as well to, uh, to cultivate that empathy within their teams and recommend these things and activities and maybe do some volunteering together, like you mentioned. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, said. Okay. 
In your book, you emphasize building meaningful relationships with clients and colleagues. Hmm. How can our listeners, mostly data professionals, integrate empathy into their interactions with stakeholders and clients? Yeah, I, I, I think that the quickest way and, and the most general is just to remember that there's another person on the side of that interaction and they have vastly different constraints and priorities and motivations and fears and hopes than you probably do. And you really need to be intentional about understanding the human sides of the projects. And from the uh, sponsor, like in the story I just uh, described, all the way down to the operational team, even the smallest data migration, the smallest data quality project, it's going to have some impact to frontline employees. And then that needs to be discussed at the, at the planning stages of a project. I find quite often when I, when I consult with people, they, they will agree on the surface, empathy is important. We need to consider people. We need to consider operationalization. What we're going to do as part of our project delivery model as a last step after we've developed and designed and we're about to deploy, we're going to come up with a communications plan that talks about the impact of people. And, and they're never considered. They're never consulted. It's just a complete afterthought to try to reduce the hit to engagement that's going to come. You, you need to begin with that operationalization in mind and, and build it around that. And as much as possible, include all of the people that are impacted all the way along the path and make sure that their views and their concerns are represented. Frontline people know the business much more than we give them credit for. And quite often mm -hmm. we stand five, six people away from them. But if we work with them, if we interview them, if we get their input early on, every project is going to be much smoother as a result. Yeah. I know it's so much harder as well with people working hybrid virtually. Oh God, yes. yes. <laughs> and I really, there's a little bit of a conversation between Dan and Pedro in the comments where Dan says the people are the biggest challenge, but also the biggest opportunity of data and analytics success. And also that research estimates nearly 60% of job success due to emotional intelligence which is also a very strong statistic and with a lot of takeaways. <laughs> and then Pedro cool. says, yes, I need to get Jeremy's book. <laughs> and yeah, absolutely. And Pedro follows up with saying it's all about, and it's, it's all about how you do things, not what you do. Hmm. Absolutely. Very great. Very good points. And so Jeremy, are there any challenges that data teams you find them facing quite often when trying to adopt an empathetic mindset? Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's on the one side of it, there's that legacy of being an offshoot of IT that we need to overcome. But mm. from my experience, and I'm, I'm going to unfairly generalize here a little bit, so I apologize, but I, I find a lot of the time we sabotage ourselves on moral or philosophical grounds. And a lot of us like being outsiders. We like being the edgy computer folks who are a little misunderstood. And we show up to meetings, we've got hoodies on, no offense, it's Friday. I'm, you know, just, <laughs> we've got stickers on our laptops and nobody understands. So there's, there's an appeal to that for sure. People want to feel like a part of a tribe. And when you are showing up like this into a meeting and everybody else has their suits on and you get excluded for your affiliation, then that kind of reinforces this sense of identity that you have. So I can certainly understand that, but it doesn't take you anywhere good long-term. That's not at all a healthy mindset. And we, we really need to be delivering projects that are going to people, not to teams. Mm -hmm. When a person is receiving your work, when you get that feedback that, thanks, Jeremy, you've made my life a little bit easier, that, that's an absolutely beautiful feeling. You've helped another human being. We're social apes at the end of it, and we're absolutely built for service. We, we need that feeling. We need that sense of community. Without it, we I've got like a dozen references in there. We get physically, mentally sick. Our blood pressure's higher. Our hormones are out of whack. We get anxiety and depression. You, you need to help people and feel like part of a community. Otherwise, you're, you're not going anywhere good. So how to overcome it? I think we just need to at least figuratively take off the hoodies and the stickers and get to know our colleagues and genuinely look for ways to help people, not just to do delivery, but to go outside your comfort zone, find ways to help people rather than just deliver projects. So if you can bear with the awkwardness of that and lean in, I think 
100 percent of people are going to feel better personally and they're going to be a lot more successful professionally yeah yeah well said um, I, but, there's actually so many good points in yeah. what you, you said it's just a, not just one thing and i realized that part of change management there's also the parts of rewards and sometimes it's hard to give people maybe financial rewards or bigger rewards, but also sometimes acknowledging someone, giving a thank you and giving credit is it, it goes such a long way because ultimately we are all trying to do our best at work and just being seen and being acknowledged and receiving that uh, gratitude it really makes our day sometimes and it's what we need to stay motivated and to uh, to continue doing our the best mm -hmm. absolutely pedro is mentioning germany is a brother from a different mother we need to stop <laughs> the us versus them dynamic less concerned about how we dress but more about uh, stopping the artificial chasm we create that is often self-induced Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think, yeah, the, this chasm is still wide, right? Between I started as a, a difference between IT and the rest of the business. And now the data is piggybacking on that IT technology, or at least how business sees this side, right? Mm -hmm. They're seeing it, oh, that's us and them a type of a thing. And we don't collaborate as much as we should. And in the end, we should all be, and we all are part of the same team driving towards the same goal uh, that the, the company has. But so can I be the devil's advocate here a little bit? So we cool. keep on talking that, yes, we, we shouldn't create a discasm. We should collaborate, be more aligned. But I feel like we were focusing that it, it's us that's separated from them type of thing. Why isn't it the other way around as well? Why, why, why shouldn't maybe the, the business side start wearing the hoodies, for example, <laughs> and, and also adopt them and tell you, how can we get closer to the data teams? How can we get closer to IT? This is a very good point. And I think we need a crack for them to get into. And in, in most cases, and, and I don't want to put the blame squarely on us, the technical folks, but I don't think we give them that opportunity, to be honest. Mm. I, I, I think that we're by nature a little bit standoffish. We, mm. you address them as the business a minute ago, and, and we tend to do that <laughs> even in our meetings. There's us, and then there's the business. There's those right. people that are outside that are obstacles to our progress. And, and that is, I think, a very deep inbuilt uh, perception that we have. One person needs to lean across and then put out a helping hand. And I, I think, honestly, it only takes one person, an executive, someone on the other side sees that there's an opportunity here and they see the benefit of that partnership. Yeah. The walls come down really quickly after that. It uh, who, who reaches out and who accepts that hand can come from either side. I don't think it matters at the end of the day, but we need to be open to it. And if not open to it, go a step further and be that one to reach out. Yeah. yeah. So my, yeah. one of my biggest messages that I'm trying to bring across, at least in my organization is say, okay, we, your success means my success and it's our success together. Okay. It's not my, us versus you or me versus someone else because if we work together then one plus one is more than two always right so we're colleagues and we are working together and we're supporting each other and so it, it's not we cannot succeed without each other but only together and also I find that the most successful people from the IT side that I work with are the ones that come from a place of, we are here to support you. What do you need? And even me from the change management part, that's my first message. Tell us what you need. We want to make your life easier. We want things to, for you to be, to come smoother, any type of change or transition that we're going through. What do you need? And the response is a lot better if you come from that angle. Absolutely. I love that. I think IT needs to be more about enablement and less about policing and telling you what you can't do. It, uh, yep. Same with data governance, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and Jeremy, I, you know, I, I completely agree with you. I just like to question things sometimes. Yeah. You know, for, for the of sake course. Of yes. <laughs> I know. Believe me, I live with this. <laughs> so once again, the book, I really like the, um, the cover as well. And it, it it gives this feeling of simplicity 
And I think that is how the book is also written. It's, that's something that's attainable. It, that it's, yeah, some, yeah, something yeah. That, that is within our grip to to gain that empathy. It's not something like a big thing that that is not within our grip. So I love that about the book and about the way that it is written. Well, yeah. You. Very actionable steps towards yeah. becoming awesome. more empathetic. So get your copy today. Check out your local Amazon mm -hmm. and uh, order it. It's going to come in a few days. And George says local Amazon because we yeah. went to Mexico last week and he wasn't able to get some stuff yeah. because of it's fine. from Amazon. Yeah. All right. And I also encourage people to follow Jeremy on LinkedIn. I'll definitely post a link again to the book in the show um, comment. So you'll be able to uh, click on it there if you're just listening and now watching this live. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for again sharing all these uh, tips and tricks and anecdotes and uh, yeah, making this attainable for a lot of us and hopefully then bridging the gap between the over the chasm uh, between the business and, and data teams or tech teams. Yes. And oh, it's yeah. one little step at a time, right? I hear so much more about communication skills, about empathy, about change management in, in the data field. So I, I really believe that we are truly heading in the right direction and Thank you very much, Jeremy, for being such a big advocate for this change. Oh, it's my pleasure. Really appreciate the opportunity to chat. It's a real honor to be on the show. And thanks so much for all you guys do. Thank you so much. So everyone, follow Jeremy on LinkedIn. Get Geeks with Empathy on Amazon. And thank you very much for being here for the questions and for the support as always. All right. Bye, everybody. All right. Thank you. <laughs>